Good afternoon. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. <clears throat> it's Wednesday, July 1st, and we're here for our uh, 2 o'clock coronavirus update. <clears throat> and we are going to talk about some issues uh, that deal outside of the direct impact of the disease, how it's affected county finances. Uh, I want to highlight that we have two more of these uh, planned updates, one tomorrow, uh, and I believe we're going to be at Wilson Woods Pool in Mount Vernon for that one, and then we'll be here Monday, July 6th, which, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we hope and expect will be the last day of phase three before we enter phase four. We'll suspend the daily updates. At that point, uh, we'll be out of the day-to-day -day reporting crisis mode. Hopefully, we'll see the numbers continue to uh, move in a general direction. Phase four is an open-ended phase, so we assume that we'll update uh, publicly what's happening uh, on a regular basis, but not on a daily basis as we have uh, different information. And uh, we intend to uh, communicate as we normally do on a host of other issues outside of the COVID crisis and some of the related impacts. Uh, for our statistics today, always the, uh, uh, the lead information for us. As of uh, today's tracker from New York State, we now have 34,866 positive cases of COVID from the beginning of the infection in March to today. The good news is, is that uh, the vast majority of those people, 34,400 or 300 some out of those people uh, have cleared and uh, are no longer actively with the virus. We have lost 1,425 individuals to COVID uh, fatalities. Uh, currently, we have 481 active cases, meaning people that have not cleared the two-week period of time. Uh, about 70 of those individuals are currently hospitalized. That number has been decreasing over the course of the last two and a half months. At one point, the number was 1,200 hospitalized, down to 70, maybe actually a little slightly less than that. Uh, we're usually a day lag behind in the statistics we get on hospitalizations. But that steady decline in hospitalizations is good news. Uh, it represents a continued indicator of the diminishment of the spread here in Westchester County. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the number of active cases actually went up by one. Uh, over yesterday, and uh, that is an uptick in that we had 28 new cases and we cleared over the two-week period 27 people from COVID from two weeks ago, so the net result is an increase in one case. Uh, down at the number we are now, that is not concerning to us. We're looking for indicators that the spread is coming back. We would look for indicators such as a significant jump in active cases, and we would also look for a geographical distribution of cases. So if we saw that they were jumping in Peekskill and Pelham and Pound Ridge in three corners of the county, then it would represent that something is happening across the board that we need to be concerned about. If we see it clustered in a particular situation, then uh, and we have a reason for why that happened, uh, then we understand where the problem is and how we address it. And that is that is less concerning to us because we then you know can deal with it in a more productive way. But overall, our numbers tested two uh, two hundred seventy thousand six hundred and ninety two uh, tests so far. We always use the general round number of a million people in Westchester County, which would mean. 27% of Westchester residents have been tested for COVID. Uh, it, it, some of those numbers, 270,692, would be a duplicate tests, but the number of duplicate tests are relatively small, uh, probably in, a, in the few hundred categories. So roughly speaking, that number does reflect single individuals being tested over the course of time. And the number of tests went up almost 4,000 from yesterday. So <clears throat> 28 additional cases uh, that tested positive out of roughly 4,000 tests is a sign of the diminishment uh, of the spread of the virus. So you'd see a much higher number of people testing positive if the virus was uh, still expanding, as it did two and a half months ago in this area. And what we see around the nation when they announce new cases, they're now announcing significant number of cases in states that had almost no cases back in March and April when we were having the bulk of our contagion. So they're still experiencing now the rising part of the bell curve in some of those other states where we are, are almost at the point where it's flattened out. But there's no virus uh, vaccine, there is no virus antiviral treatment, so no one can feel uh, unduly confident. Uh, we're trying to manage something that we don't control. That's really sort of the differentiation, the way we look at it. Uh, and we continue to see positive signs, but we have to continue the behavior that has helped us get to this point. Wearing masks, I say it every day, I don't particularly love wearing the mask, uh, but we wear it because it's a protection for the people that we're next to so that I don't infect you, therefore I wear the mask. You wear the mask so you don't infect me. Social distancing, which you can imagine is not my uh, normal way of operating with people. And uh, constant sanitization, washing of your hands. Uh, you know, my mother told me to do it. 
Didn't really do it most of my life. Now in my 60th, 60th year, I have to make sure I do it on a regular basis, and so do you. And those are behaviors that are necessary to fight the pandemic. That's why we're doing it, to fight the pandemic, to make sure we keep this thing on a downslope, uh, and hopefully to the point where the vaccine is discovered and is able to be given widely, and then we, we find ourselves protected. Or we have an antiviral treatment, so if you contract the disease, then, it, then there's a treatment that will keep you healthy and, uh, and avoid the, the worst case scenario, which is fatality. All of these things, though, has had a major change in our society. This is July 1st, uh, which means we're halfway between the, the New Year's Day, New Year's Day of 2020, six months ago, New Year's Day 2021, six months ahead. And if any of us go back to New Year's Eve, whatever you did, uh, whatever resolutions you made on New Year's Eve, whatever you foresaw the year ahead, for some people they had big things happening in their lives, uh, a momentous birthday, a wedding in the family, uh, a birth of a child, things that, that they looked forward to, graduation and so forth. We're now six months into the year. We've seen a very different year than we would have hoped for on New Year's Eve. And about mid-March or so, when it became clear that Westchester County, along with the rest of the New York metropolitan area, was going to face a significant hit from COVID, actions were taken. We took actions here in Westchester County. New York State government, under the leadership of Governor Cuomo, took actions. Local folks, businesses, we all took different steps to try to deal with the contagion. And most of those steps wound up costing us economically. We wound up seeing, in essence, the economy of our, of our area shut down on or about the middle part of March, 15th of March. Some things closed slightly after that, some things before that. That shutdown, amongst many other things, has had a direct and, and severe economic impact on individuals, individuals who have lost their jobs, individuals who work on an hourly basis have had a significant cutback in their hours. Small businesses, when they close their doors, uh, are finding that they can't reopen. They don't have the, the resources to open capital uh, or the operating flow of revenue to open their doors. Major corporations are, are significantly affected by it. Some industries of major corporations, airline industry, hotel industry, definitely you know, dramatically impacted. You've seen some major retail stores uh, go Chapter 11 and decide to close store branches. And in some cases, the whole chain has gone under for reasons. And many times what happens, just like with the individual that contracts COVID and has other health issues, and, and the COVID has a very severe effect on it because of the other health issues, uh, any business or any individual that's in sort of a marginal financial situation will, will have seen a major impact. And the same is true. It's true for churches and not-for-profit organizations, and it's also true for governments. So part of what I want to discuss today is the financial impacts of COVID. We face right now as a county government three basic major issues. The public health crisis of COVID, which we, we've been trying to manage, and I hope we've managed it reasonably well. We've made some mistakes. We've tried to correct those things. We've moved forward as reasonably as we can. And number two is what I'm going to talk about today, which is the economic impact of COVID. The third issue, which I've addressed a little bit last week and then prior this week, is the rise of the, the, the social justice issue, the racial justice issue that is uh, critical to the society. And we've talked in a prior conversation about how we've created a task force to tackle some of those issues. But the financial issues are real, and they're significant. And they're not only Westchester County government's issues. New York State has a similar problem. Other county governments have had a similar problem. I've talked to my fellow county executives on Long Island and upstate New York to varying degrees. Uh, all of us have uh, some version of this. Uh, many local governments are facing significant crises as well. And of course, there's always a temptation to play politics with it at this time. You know, someone who uh, wants to look and say, well, this is a managerial situation and it's uh, your fault or his fault. When you see a problem like this that's universal and it's clearly tied to a nationwide situation, you realize that we are all in this together. This is not a matter of which uh, political party is in charge of which particular government, which level of government is. This is an across the board problem. But that's not a solution. To, to, def to define how we got here is not the same as to discuss how we're going to get out of here. So let me talk a little bit about what the specifics of the problem is in terms of Westchester County finances and then talk a little bit about what our strategies are to, uh, to deal with it because we are not going to wring our hands and, de and decry our fate. We're going to try to move intelligently and aggressively to solve the problem that's placed before us in the same way that we responded to the COVID-19. When we adopted our budget in December of last year, which seems like a long time ago, uh, we had a $2.1 billion budget, which was balanced between revenues and expenses. Uh, most of the increase in that budget, you'll hear people say that was an increase in budget over the prior year, and that was primarily because of costs 
that were borne by the county to implement certain statewide programs. We had to raise the age requirement, uh, which involves our corrections department to, to create uh, separate uh, areas for um, uh, 16 and 17 year olds from the regular prison population. We've done that at Woodfield Cottage at a significant expense, perhaps a $40 million expense. We also had to hire additional people and bring out additional costs to implement new uh, criminal justice reform issues that were passed by the state legislature or signed by the governor last year that we had to implement this year that involved both our police and our correction officials. So those increases came to $2.1 billion budget, but because of our revenue streams, projected based on prior years and, and what our success we had had in closing out 2019, we were able to prevent a, uh, present a balanced budget that included a million dollar cut in county property taxes. Now, different people got different levels of the cut once it was uh, structured through the different communities and equalization rates in different communities. Uh, I know that some folks had a very significant cut, some had a minor cut, some were level, a couple uh, did not have a cut, but it balances out to a million dollar cut. And we were moving forward in January and February with all of our revenue projections on schedule, slightly ahead of schedule, January and February. The same way businesses were on plan in January and February and in the first five, six, seven, ten days of March. In the middle of March when COVID-19 hit us, and it hit us first compared to many other areas, we saw the impact here very quickly, we started to see a significant drop in tax revenue. Now, the two major tax streams in, in uh, Westchester County is property taxes and sales taxes. There are other revenue streams, but those are the two largest ones. Those two make up the vast majority of the revenue that we use to fund this government. We have state reimbursements, federal reimbursements. They're impacted by this. So we have five or six other different uh, levels of, uh, of revenue that impact our budget. But property taxes generally are fixed to the greater extent, but sales tax and some of the other revenue streams follow the economy. When the economy goes up, more people spend money, and then sales tax revenue is generated on a higher level. When the economy goes down and less people are spending money, there's less sales tax revenue. So that revenue stream, uh, which is slightly below $600 million in our budget, was impacted dramatically by the closure of businesses. Very logically put, when you close all retail stores, when you close restaurants, when you close movie theaters, when you close uh, a host of other different entities that charge sales tax for their property, you lose revenue. We lose revenue. The local governments that get a share back of that money lose revenue. The state government that relies on sales tax loses revenue. And we saw from the latter part of March that we fell behind sort of dramatically. And we went into the month of April, and in the whole month of April, and in the whole month of May, basically this, uh, this county and counties like ours were shut down. We had very little uh, activity. There's certain things that still generate sales tax revenue, uh, paying gasoline at the pump. There's, there's a few. But most of it was a dramatic drop. And we looked at a, a tremendous loss of sales tax revenue. We, we saw a loss in some of the lesser revenue streams, such as hotel occupancy tax, uh, we're still looking to see the mortgage recording tax impact. There may be a loss in the short term, may rally a little bit later this year. Uh, we also uh, saw that revenue fell off in, uh, in our bus revenues because people uh, who lost their jobs when you shut the business down weren't taking the county bus to go to work anymore. So the ridership started to drop dramatically and therefore the revenue dropped dramatically. We started to see uh, a lesser use of uh, certain park revenues and services. And then as we projected ahead to the summertime, sitting in April, we could see that we were not gonna hit our revenue goals that were seasonal. We expected to do seasonally well in the summertime with day camps and playland being open and so forth. And you could begin to see if these things aren't gonna open, we're not gonna have the revenue as expected from those uses. And then of course, the state and the federal government both had uh, important reimbursements to us. And the state, because of their financial problems, immediately sent the word out, it was covered you know, by the various media outlets, uh, that they were in financial trouble and they weren't necessarily gonna be able to reimburse or to give money to the counties and the local governments as they might have originally planned in their budget. We came up with an estimate in April that we would be between 180 million and $250 million off in revenue for the year. That is directly related to COVID. Had COVID not hit us, if we did not shut down the businesses that were shut down, if we did not lose the, uh, the economic engine and activity in Westchester, 
we would not have had this gap. There was, there was no particular activity that any of us did or didn't do that generated this loss of revenue. Now, the range of 180 to 250 depends on some variables. The most obvious variable is when will the society go back to what it was on February 29th and March 1st, and nobody knows the answer to that question. We know as we've gone through these phases now, we've opened up retail stores, we had retail curbside, then for two weeks we had full retail, but it's not truly full retail because if you're a store inside a mall, you're not open. Uh, we've had a restoration of, of uh, outside dining and now inside dining, but at a lower level so that they're not generating the same amount of revenue that they were before. Many restaurants who were just hanging on with takeout went from takeout to outside dining. It helped them, you know, survive, but not enough to hit their numbers of profit. And, and some of those restaurants didn't reopen or haven't reopened because of the revenue situation. And uh, that's also applicable to other businesses. And there are still businesses that are not open, and we don't know when the state will give authority for them to open. Uh, health clubs, gymnasiums, we don't know when they're going to open. Movie theaters, there's some provisions now that, that uh, may allow them to open if they uh, work on their HVAC system. But until that happens, that revenue is off. So our projection of $180 million in, in total revenue lost is the lower level, meaning best case scenario. The $250 million is a worst case scenario. Now, worse could be worse than that because we're assuming as we project ahead without assuming that there's going to be a second wave of COVID. We don't know that there will be. We don't know that there won't be. We don't want to assume there will be, but we have an outside number from 180. What happens if the economy shuts back down and instead of having starting a rising revenue because of the economic activity, it dips again. And you could make the argument that even when you open a business, there is no guarantee that the same percentage of people will come will we'll feel comfortable enough to go out, and not for any fault of the business or the government. It's just individuals will make individual decisions, and they'll decide whether they feel comfortable walking into a movie theater, even if you open them, or going to a sporting event, even if you allow the event to happen. So we have a range from 180 to 250. Also built into that range is the potential that the state, in closing their budget gap, may hit the county with uh, additional charges or may not reimburse us for charges that they would otherwise reimburse us for. And that could widen our gap. And in those situations, we have no control over that. If the state determines they're not going to reimburse us for something or they're going to owe it to us and pay us back in 10 years, we don't have it in our budget right now to balance our budget. And the budget was balanced, $2.1 billion balance, budgeted on the revenues that were fairly projected in the way we went through the budget and, and how the budget was ultimately adopted. So we knew by April that we were going to be looking at a major gap, and now we have to figure out uh, exactly what we're going to do about it. We took some actions in April. We talked about that. We had a press conference at the time, and those actions totaled uh, $21.2 million of uh, reduced expenditures. There were three particular actions that were taken. We, uh, we made the decision to bond for certiorari payments. Certiorari are tax rebates that are awarded by the court to businesses who go into court and they argue that they were overassessed and therefore overtaxed. And then a reimbursement is required by the court. It's authorized and the Latin word certiorari has it's been proven and then we have to reimburse. By the way, that happens. Local school districts do the reimbursements. Towns, villages, cities, whatever else, levy local taxes also have to make those reimbursements. When we constructed the 20 uh, budget, the 2020 budget, we made a point of saying we were not going to bond for certioraries because that had been the past practice over the last prior years. Why wouldn't you bond for it, ideally? Because when you bond for something, you pay interest as well as principal back. If you have 100 bucks in your pocket and you can spend it, that's fine. If you go to your friend and say, can you loan me 100 bucks? And the guy says, sure, but you're going to pay me back some interest. You're going to wind up paying back $110 for the benefit of having $100 when you need it. That's what interest is. So that thought in mind, you prefer not to borrow it. And we thought it was an improved practice on our part to avoid borrowing to pay for certiorari actions, which had been the practice for a number of years. I had to reverse that in order to save uh, for the budget uh, $7 million on this huge gap of 180 uh, uh, range, 180 up to $250 million. So we made the decision to bond for an additional year for certioraries. We also made the decision to uh, have a pension smoothing arrangement. New York State sends out a pension bill each year, comes late in the year, 
uh, whatever number that is, we have to pay it. That is what our contribution to keep a well-funded pension system is. New Jersey hasn't done that. Illinois hasn't done that. It's destabilized their state finances. New York pays uh, up uh, up to the date as to what it is, and every jurisdiction that has employees that are part of the pension system must pay that. So we looked at that number, and we were going to pay for whatever that number was. We put in the budget as an expense, and now we're going to involve pension smoothing, which the state allows us to spread our costs out over a multiple year period of time. So we pay less in one particular year, but over the course of time, we'll pay more for the total cost of it. We've had to do that. That saved us $4 million. We also intended to add $10 million to our reserve fund. Our reserve fund uh, at its lowest was $64 million. We added $5 million to the reserve fund last year to get up to 69. We wanted to get that number up to like 150. That's a prudent fiscal number to get to. It had not been at that number for years prior to our administration. Uh, we intended to put another $10 million in, and we thought that was going to inch our way back up. It's like putting money in your savings account. If you have 500 bucks in your savings account, that doesn't get you very far if you have to tap your savings. So while you can, you put a couple of bucks aside out of every paycheck, and you grow your savings account. Same principle. We were going to put $10 million into that savings account this year. We could not do that because of this crisis. We now wouldn't have the, on the revenue side sufficient revenue. So we took the $10 million, we reversed it. The net result of those three decisions, $21.2 million, $21 million uh, lowering our gap. If our gap is 180 to 250, we lowered it by $21 million with those actions. Those were actions done in April. Two of those actions required Board of Legislative approval. And of course, we briefed the Board on what, on what actions we could take uh, administratively to reverse the fund balance. Now we have two act three actions that we're looking at in the month of uh, July to deal with uh, our balance, which will have the impact of $41 million of closing that gap. So if the gap is 180, we closed it by 20 million. We're now closing another 40, uh, slightly over $40 million by a series of four actions. Three of them are revenues. We have done our homework and we have determined that we can reliably identify $30 million in additional transit aid for the Beeline bus system. That's a solid, reliable $30 million. And that uh, will be additional revenue that will come in from that revenue stream. We've identified that the Medicaid uh, program, the Enhanced Federal Programs, FMAP is the acronym, will reliably deliver us $4.7 million more than was uh, estimated in the budget. And we've also identified that uh, one of our contracts with the U.S. Marshals Service will generate an additional $3.8 million for the county this year. Those three actions, coupled with uh, the savings of $2.8 million in our corrections department because of the reduced number of inmates, our inmate count is very low in our uh, county jail. We have 1,800 beds, but the count is much lower than uh, was uh, anticipated. We identify that's a $2.8 million savings. When you take the three revenues and the additional savings of $2.8 million, then we find another $41 million to help cut the number down. So an aggregate total of actions, $62.5 million to try to bring down that gap to get it lower and lower as much as we can. So as we take these actions early in the month of July, we now bring our gap down to a range of about $118 million on the low side, $188 million on the, on the higher side. And we obviously hope that we'll be dealing with the lower number. That still gives us a large gap, but it's a lot less than the gap that we started out with in the month of April. And these are actions that we've taken proactively. We're not waiting to find out, oh, my God, we have a big gap. How are we going to cover it and how are we going to pay it? This leads us now to the action uh, that we're going to take now, which is our voluntary separation program. Some locations are looking at layoffs and furloughs. We would prefer to balance the budget without layoffs and furloughs. And let me tell you why, quite frankly. If we lay off a significant number of people in the county government, we're going to add to the economic downturn of this county. We are going to exacerbate the problems that you have right now, less people, having money, more people going on unemployment, less people being able to spend money at those stores that open. And those stores open. If they don't have enough people going in there to buy whatever the products or services are, then those entities are going to have difficulty staying afloat. And if everybody takes the attitude, we're going to lay people off to get our own bottom line in, you're going to have the continuation of the vicious circle down. So we're going to try to balance this budget without 
having to lay people off and without furloughs. Furloughs, uh, I assume most people know, but it's when you take a week or two weeks uh, without pay in a given month. So if you're uh, you know, working in a full month, you're furloughed one or two weeks out of the month, you get half or a quarter less of your salary. You're still employed, but you're just taking less. Now that's the hit to the family budget. And again, that will uh, influence your ability to uh, purchase goods and services in the marketplace and to, to feed your family and to pay your rent or your mortgage payments. So we're gonna to try to do that, uh, we're gonna to try to avoid that. And we think that that is the right philosophical place to be. But we have to cut our labor costs. Labor is such a significant part of every entity. I spent 20 years in corporate life before I got into a government at any level of it. And we understand that the, the labor, the workforce of any company is important. The reporters that are in the room, the, the camera member, the cameramen for the electronic folks that are doing this uh, are part of a labor force of a corporation. And if the corporation determines that they can do with less reporters, less cameramen, less editors, and they decide to do that, the product that is produced suffers. And the individuals who are out of work can no longer interact in the economy the same way they would when they were employed. So in the same way that it involves for any of us, uh, we're looking to see how can we cut labor costs, which we can do with a voluntary separation initiative. We believe that what I'm about to describe can save us as much as one to two million dollars this year for the 2020 budget, which would be a further reduction in the numbers I've just said. And just as importantly, it can save us six to ten million dollars in 2021. How does that save you money? I'll give you a, a, a broad example. A person who is making uh, $80,000 a year and uh, determines that they've worked here for a certain amount of time, and we offer them a, a cash settlement, a lump sum payment that would uh, equal the amount of years, $1,000 per year of service. If they view that, or wherever they are in their life, they say, you know what, that works for me. I accept it. They now go off our payroll. And if they go off our payroll, and we're trying to do this for August 1st, but, but to make the numbers a little bit easier for me, if they went off on September 1st, that's a third of the year. So the $80,000 annual salary, we, we won't pay a third of that. We slice a third of it off. If what we pay them in a, in a severance payment is less than what they would pay, what we would pay out if they stayed in their office, then the county saves money on that. And then when the new year begins, that position is empty. And we can make the decision based on the nature of the job, do we refill it at all? If we don't, that's an annualized saving of 80,000. Do we fill it mid-year, savings of 40,000? And if we do in fact hire somebody new, we hire somebody new who will come in at a lower salary than the person who left at a higher salary. But the departure is not mandatory, it's voluntary. The individual decides whether it's right in their life. And, and there's a thousand reasons why a person may determine that it's right to take a lump sum severance. They may decide they're at a certain age of life where they were thinking of retiring anyway. They may be the second income in a family and the primary income is prepared to move or take uh, another opportunity. Uh, someone may decide I have my own business model in my head and if I get a lump sum, that lump sum will help me start that business. Someone may say, well, what I do here, I could do someplace else. So I could take the severance, it's to my benefit and be rehired in some other entity. Whatever those reasons are, those are individual reasons. But it's a voluntary program and it's important to highlight. This is an example of my respect in the main for the workforce of the county because I believe that those individuals can make those decisions on their own and their valued work is valued. We know that we can't deliver the services without qualified people there. So we'll have to determine when a person takes the severance, what do we do about the refilling of the position? And I know a lot of people say this all the time. I don't know what county government does for me. I'd, I'd be happy to teach the course if you'd be happy to listen, but I'm sure most people wouldn't. You live your life. You raise your families. You have your careers. You don't worry a whole heck of a lot about government until something goes wrong or until it affects you directly. But we provide sewer treatment for for. 70% of the county, something like that. That's a county responsibility and function. If we stopped treating sewerage, you would see the problem immediately in your home, in your bathroom. And, and we would have a societal problem of public health if we can't deal with our sewerage. And that's something the county government does. We run a county jail. And there's a reason why we have a county jail, because some people have broken laws and have done something in such a severe manner 
and they have been adjudicated and it's been determined that they need to be outside of that society for a certain period of time so that they don't continue whatever that behavior may be. You may not see that you need that, but that is a protection for you. And to run a jail is a significant expense, one of the largest expenses that we have in this county. And I could go through other elements of the county government. It shouldn't be lost on anybody, the talent of our Department of Health officials during this pandemic. The, uh, the county nurses that went into homes, put themselves in harm's way to test for COVID, which involves a rather up-close and personal process of getting a swab filled to know whether or not a person has the disease. And our nurses went out to do that. And they're county employees, they're government employees, which oftentimes anyone who works for the government is sort of disdained as uh, really not being, you know, uh, necessarily working that hard because they work for the government, quote unquote. Uh, we have a lot of very talented people. And I don't, I don't want to lose any of these people. But just like my announcement yesterday about closing Playland, I don't want to close Playland. The 12-year-old George Latimer lectured the 66-year-old George Latimer continually about don't close Playland. But I had to do it. It was, the, it was the necessary and right thing to do. And it is the necessary and right thing to do right now to uh, make this offer, to try to determine how many of our employees uh, choose to participate in the program, to see if or not we can um, close the gap that we face. And uh, this program has to be approved by the Board of Legislators on uh, July 13th at their board meeting. They'll have the usual discussion and debate. We've briefed the leadership of the board on this a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. Uh, we've talked to the various unions that are involved. This will apply to the CSEA union, to the Teamsters union, to the nurses union, and all to non-representative management, people who are not in a union in a management position. It does not apply to Westchester Community College. It does not apply to the DA investigators. They work for the county, but they work under the uh, direction of a separately elected official, the district attorney. Um, it does not apply to any elected officials. Uh, it also does not apply to our police and correction officers, the uniformed departments. Uh, we are under certain mandates to maintain um, uh, a certain number of people to do those functions. Uh, for example, uh, we cannot cut slots uh, in corrections without an approval from the state uh, Department of Criminal Services. Uh, so even if we had a decision where we lost uh, one or two members of a particular department, planning department, budget department, IT, so forth, we can choose whether or not we restaff the position short term, long term, whatever. We can't do that with a correctional institution. The state will not allow that. So to offer uh, a departure benefit, have an individual leave, and then have to replace them immediately after that, then there is no savings to the budget. So uh, unfortunately, we're not able to extend that. This program exactly parallels what was done by this government in 2010 and again in 2015, both times by my immediate predecessor. So what we're doing today does not break any precedent from the past. We also were uh, awaiting to see if any action would come out of the state that would allow for an early retirement program. This is not an early retirement program because the county government cannot convey retirement credits. Only the state can. It's the state uh, retirement program that, that applies. In the past, at various times, most recently in 2010, the state has uh, allowed for early retirement incentives in which they not only deal with a dollar amount, they also deal with the amount of credit. So if you've worked X number of years and you're just X num Y number of years short of having full vesting, they could pass a law that could give you the benefit and credit you with those years so that you would then qualify. We can't do that. So our voluntary separation program, we, we sort of held off to see if the state was going to act. Uh, we can't hold off any longer because we need to have some benefit for the 2020 budget. If the state does act uh, in the period of time between now and uh, when this thing is fully operative, then uh, certainly the state, uh, the state plan will, uh, will over, uh, overarch our efforts. But we have to do something along these lines, and so we've gone ahead and moved off uh, to do this. The, uh, the date to notify the county by the individual employee is July 24th. I have communicated with the relevant workforce by email and uh, with a little video explanation. Uh, those folks who work in county government now are having the discussions, I assume, tonight over a cup of coffee at their home with their significant others. They're going to have a discussion about whether this matters to them or not. By July 24th, they'll let us know, and then we'll have an idea of just how many people choose to participate in the program. If we get a large participation in the program, then the savings to the county will be greater. That's why I gave you a range of one to two million. In theory, if we have a low participation, then the savings would not be as high, and we won't know that until we see the final result of that. And all of that will wind up being, in essence, an August action to uh, reduce the budget gap. The numbers I've just shown you that brought us down like 118 and 188. Um, 
through the month of uh, July, people will make decisions, then in August we'll know. Once we know what the scope of that is, we're then going to look at what the remaining budget gap is, if we've saved some money through this effort, and then we're going to go department by department and looking for additional um, uh, opportunities to realistically uh, affect savings on the expenditure side of the budget without hurting our ability to deliver services. And uh, that will be a department by department function. Certainly as we aggregate those into numbers, we'll be happy to share it back with the press and indicate that we have you know, identified X million dollars of savings in, in doing a particular function or not. Uh, let me just uh, close by saying a couple of things very generally, we'll open it up to questions. The first thing is, is that uh, it is a very difficult thing for me, as I, as I said previously, to, um, to stand here and tell you these things. There are times when, when to be candid in government is very difficult. And oftentimes you don't see candor in public officials because the news they deliver is not good news. And who wants to tell somebody bad news? Who wants to go home to mom and dad with a bad report card and say, here, dad, I really did lousy. You know what's coming, and it's not pleasant. Uh, if you look back uh, a little over two years ago, we knew that we could not open the Sprain Ridge pools in Yonkers. We were going to have to keep them closed for another year because they'd have to undergo reconstruction. They were reconstructed, opened in 17, and then we found that, that the job that was done was rushed and, and problems occurred, cracks and pipe breakings, and we would have to completely redo the pool in 18. And I had to have a press conference which I said, we're not going to be able to uh, open these pools in 18. But you have my word, we're going to work on it, and we'll open it in 19, and that's exactly what we did in 19. It was difficult, but we got through it. And now, of course, it's been opened again in 20. It's a beautiful complex down there, and, uh, and, and we go forward. The Miller House bobbed back and forth, the Washington headquarters in North Castle. You may not know it, depending on where you live in the county. Those who live in the area know it. it's a beautiful county-owned facility that served as Washington's headquarters for a night or two during the Battle of White Plains, as I am told. Um, uh, there was a 10-year debate over whether it should be renovated or not. We made the decision to renovate it. It took a year and a half to do it, but it got done. And now if you go by it, you'll see that, it's, that, that it has been preserved for future generations, long after not only am I not county executive, but I'm not traveling the streets of Westchester anymore. Some things are difficult news to deliver, and this is difficult news. I did not enter this job hoping to cut the workforce. I, I hoped to energize the workforce. I believed that the workers of Westchester County had not been treated fairly, and, having, and if they could be treated fairly, that they would respond as they had in years past. And I saw the examples of that happening all throughout this county over the last two and a half years, how people were energized and we were doing more things and better things. And there was a great desire on the part of most people to prove that, that what they were doing was valid work. Unfortunately, now I don't have that luxury. COVID, the financial situation have hit us, and, and we have to make prudent decisions. So to the workforce, I say I respect you individually. I care deeply about you. This is a decision now that you have to make. Uh, if you choose not to take the uh, separation program, it's not mandatory. If you do decide to take it, you don't leave uh, you know, in an urgent rush, get out the door. Uh, you leave with our respect and love, and we hope that you know, as we go forward, we'll figure out how to deal with the shrunken workforce. Uh, we may find down the line that the federal government is there to give us a helping hand. They may not. The state may be in a position to give us a helping hand. They may not. But Westchester has never been a uh, dependent entity. We've been self-reliant. Um, my predecessors, all of them, have, have dealt with the crisis of their day. This is the crisis of my day. If this is a greater crisis, it may well be. I don't think any prior county executive faced a potential gap of $250 million of revenue in the year for the year. But it doesn't matter. I'm here now, and I have a responsibility. And this step is one step in that direction. With that in mind, I'll open it up to any press questions. Samantha, since you took the effort to come in. <laughs> yeah, do you have any a certain goal as far as how many employees voluntarily decide to leave or a certain dollar amount? And if you don't reach that goal, is there a plan in place for that? Well, uh, the first thing is, you know, if, if we have a target, I think we, we identify that on the upside, we, we could save somewhere between one to two million dollars in this year's budget, and then because we'd have a full year of benefit, it would be a six to ten million dollar benefit in next year's budget. The reason for the for the for the swing is we don't know who'll take advantage of it. If uh, if I knew that five people who currently make a hundred thousand dollars a year were going to take advantage of it, then I could calculate 
what the numbers would be. If the, if the same five people are making $60,000 a year, as you might imagine, the benefit to the county would be less, even though the individual would get what was proportionate to their time. Um, and each individual is in a different place, uh, you know, financially to determine whether, whether this lump sum payment helps them and so forth. We have, by the way, I didn't mention this in my general comments, but we've also uh, created a structure so that if there are individuals who have served 18 or 19 years approaching the 20-year mark and they need to bridge health care, we can help bridge health care for them uh, in this period of time. It's a very select group of people that might take this plan that fall into that particular category. But that's why there's a vagueness in terms of the numbers. Now, if we do in fact save a million to two million this year, uh, that's helpful to us. The six to 10 next year is gonna be helpful because next year's budget at this point does not look good. Um, if we knew that the economy was gonna be back up on September 1st and we would be roaring and we'd go into the new year in six months and we would be back to where we were in January of this year, then I might not have a budget problem, but we don't know that. We don't know the second wave. Uh, and, and the governor controls what opens and what doesn't open. So if he determines that we're not gonna open movie theaters, which is movie theaters as an example. If he doesn't open movie theaters all year, then there's nothing we can do about that. That's just lost revenue that's coming. So that's really the reason for the, the vagueness in our expectations. Um, we haven't correlated the dollars to actual numbers of people because it depends on what the salary levels are. We also know that aside from the things that I've just mentioned, which is you know a person of a certain age who is probably going to retire anyway or somebody who has another business interest, second income in a family, there's also quite a lot of people who are concerned about their health. And even though we take precautions in the society now, we wear the masks and all that stuff, there's some people that, that don't want to come back out into the marketplace. They feel vulnerable. Uh, I've, I've mentioned my age already, so uh, I can understand people in a certain age category. When you see that a high proportion of people that have been affected and have suffered fatality are in that age cohort, there are some number of people who are going to say, you know what, I love my job, but I'm not going back there because I don't want to be in a situation where I'm dealing with people in the public and and I could catch it from somebody. So some people may decide to opt into this because of that. They've reached a point in their life where they say, you know what, I love my job, but I'm just not going to go back into a situation like that. We don't know that. We'll know it in a month or a little past a month. So I'd say sometime, I would say sometime by mid-August, certainly by late August, we'll have a public reporting of how many people took the plan, uh, how much money uh, we uh, expect to save this year and next year. And then depending on who took it and how they took it will be, the, will be the tale. But as I indicated, this is not the end of our efforts. This is just this next step. So we've taken some steps that didn't involve personnel. This involves personnel. And depending on what we do here, that will inform us of how we go forward in some other areas to see what we can do. And if not enough people do volunteer, I know you said you, of course, want to avoid layoffs and furloughs and anything of that sort. Is that something that you may have to deal with if not enough people do volunteer? Well, it's the last resort. And with anything that's a last resort, uh, you know, you have a, uh, you have a car. I don't know if you've, you've had this. I did this when I was younger. I had a car that was not in particularly good shape, and I didn't particularly have a lot of money for it. So I tried to fix it myself, and I had my friends help me, and we'd buy a part, and we'd jimmy rig it, and, you know, maybe the horn didn't work properly. We did everything we could before I had to junk the car. At some point in time, I junked the car. Um, but uh, you, you try every strategy you can to avoid having it. So I don't want to put those things on the table as if there's a threat. Because I, I never believe that, you know, those, that, that is the way to deal with people. Uh, obviously, we have to get this budget down as close to uh, even as possible. We, we cannot, we're not legally able to run a, um, an unbalanced budget. Uh, we may get a helping hand from the feds. We don't know. You, you follow the national news like I follow, but I have no more insight than anybody else would. Uh, there's some reticence to help local governments directly for lost revenue. On the other hand, the lost revenue problems are now not just New York and New Jersey and Connecticut. What you're watching around the country is the same thing that's happened here is now happening to local governments in Arizona, California, Texas, uh, North Carolina, Mississippi. And before this year is over, sad to say, because I hope nobody dies. I don't wish any ill on anybody anywhere in the country. But before this year is over, you're going to have people from southern and western states, governments in southern and western states, just as impacted as those of us in the Northeast. And so the federal government will have to take a second look as to whether they're going to help us out or not. Because if we do reach the point, and not just our government, but the local governments, if we reach the point where we have to lay people off, we're not just laying off the fat which is what somebody who really has never looked at a county budget thinks. Oh, it's all fat. Never looked at the budget. You look at the budget. We lay off police officers. Do you want us to do that? Do you want us to lay off 
uh, uh, emergency operation people? Do you want us to lay off Department of Health people? Is that what you really want us to do? Because the world of civil services, when you lay people off, uh, you, can, you can eliminate positions, but the people with the greatest seniority stay. The newest people that came in are the ones that have to go. So you just don't pick, I want that position gone. You drop three positions, and three positions are picked based on civil service rules. So uh, it's not a pretty thing to do this, and we want to try to avoid it. So we don't consider it on the table until and unless we get to last resort. Thank you. You got it. Other questions that we may have uh, remotely, Catherine Chaffee, our Director of Communications. Uh, we have one uh, question from David Proper off topic. He asks, um, is there any discussion of setting up a sort of containment zone similar to New Rochelle in March uh, for Chappaqua? We don't think it's necessary at this stage of the game. Uh, what, we, what we did not have in March, and when the governor created the containment zone, what we did not have in March is we did not have easy access to testing, across the board COVID testing. It was a very hard process. You had to go in home and you could test only a limited number of people a day. So you couldn't really test to find out the extent of the contagion. And we did not have contact tracing on the level that we have it now. So that if you identify that there's one or two or three people that have it, you can track all the people that connect to those one or two or three, or in this case, 19 people. So we don't think a containment zone is, is necessary. When you go back to the original Nourishell infection, it began with an individual who was an adult whose contacts triggered around a particular religious uh, affiliation that they had. And so it, wasn't, it was geographically centered around the religious institution and the people who live, generally speaking, in close proximity. That's why there was a geography attached to it. When you deal with high school students, if you go to that field night in Chappaqua, there were kids there from Fox Lane that could come from Bedford or uh, Pound Ridge that could have been on that field that night. You certainly had at least uh, some, some young people that came from Pleasantville, Mount Pleasant, perhaps Ossining, certainly Millwood, if not Chappaqua, and other places in that kind of a gathering. So the containment zone in a situation like that would be you know, almost incredible to think. So I don't think that's the strategy. I think the strategy is contact tracing, testing, isolation, retest as necessary, and uh, as long as everybody cooperates. And this is one of the big problems we have in contact tracing. Contact tracing is you call me, and I have to tell you all the people I've seen in 14 days. Now, I may not remember everybody I saw. I may not want to tell you that I was with a particular, you know, conversation with a particular group of people. But uh, you, have to, you have to be upfront about that. And, and if you don't do that, and if the people don't respond to the call of the contact tracer, you know, some folks, they see the thing, they figure, well, this means I'm going to be, uh, you know, isolated. I don't want to do that. You have to do it. You have to do it. Are you going to infect other people? And it's, it's, it's one of the most selfish things you could do by, by pleasuring yourself and putting other people at risk. So uh, we think we're in a different place today, uh, David, uh, who asked the question, and we don't think that a containment zone is necessary. However, all options are always open to the governor. And if the governor chooses at some point in time, if this thing uh, a week from today is a completely different number than the numbers we're talking about now, because remember, that's what happened in New Rochelle. We went from one to 100 like that. If this becomes 100 overnight, um, you know, the governor has the option to do things that uh, he sees as fit. But I think at this point, I don't believe a containment zone is necessary. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I apologize for the, uh, you know, sort of the long, detailed uh, explanation, and I gather a lot of this stuff is not particularly thrilling television, but we try to be uh, as transparent as we can. And as we discuss the issues of the criminal justice uh, reform issues with uh, law enforcement, as we discuss the COVID issues themselves, just the, the health care issues, and now the budget. We're trying to show that, that government is not done all behind closed doors. We certainly have meetings and discussions and so forth, but that we, we report on where we are. This isn't about anything being rigged. This is about people who are trying to intelligently work through what is a very difficult situation. We've never seen a contagion like this. I don't think we've ever seen a budget problem like this. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever seen the cry for social reform quite as loud as we're hearing it today. And all of those three things have been left on the table of every town supervisor, every city mayor, uh, every county executive, every governor. And uh, our job is to respond to it as best as we can. I'm George Latimer. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock for another one of our updates. In the meantime, stay safe.